Imagine the agony and emotional pain that comes with losing a family member, loved one, or having your children forcibly separated from you. This painful experience lays the foundation for the narrative of Australia's indigenous peoples, popularly known as the Aboriginals. These people, who were the original custodians of their land, endured untold suffering and cruelty following the European invasion. They experienced unimaginable hardships over many generations, with their land stolen, their children taken, and their rights and identities denied. Over the years, they have borne the brutal weight of this dark chapter in history marked by injustices. This is the untold story of Australia's indigenous people, a narrative veiled in darkness for far too long. On this episode of The Natives' Journals, we will shine a light on the dark secrets of the Australian aboriginals you've never heard of. Keep watching this video as we unveil the inhumane treatments and ordeals they pass through. Please remember to subscribe to our channel and click on the notification bell so you don't miss out on our captivating stories. Indigenous Australians are descendants of ethnic groups that lived in Australia before British colonization. They comprise two main groups, Aboriginal people of the mainland and Tasmania and Torres Strait Islander people from the seas near Queensland and Papua New Guinea. Terms like Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples and First Nations of Australia are used to describe them. The indigenous peoples of Australia boast a rich history and diverse cultures dating back over 65,000 years. They have a profound connection to the land, expressed through art, storytelling, and spirituality. Each community has unique languages, traditions, and kinship systems. In certain regions, Aboriginal people survived by hunting and gathering food from the land, adopting a mobile or semi-nomadic lifestyle to follow the shifting food sources with changing seasons. However, the way of life and material culture differed significantly from one region to another. Some Arais had permanent settlements and practiced at agriculture, while others primarily relied on hunting and foraging. Things were going well for the Aboriginal people until European exploration erected on their land, bringing significant challenges and changes. These changes, brought by European exploration, not only disrupted traditional ways of life, but also led to horrific incidents, with complete communities wiped out by gunfire. The people herded off cliffs, some burnt alive, and several others subjected to poisonings through the use of strychnine, widely regarded as one of the most excruciating ways to die. Contact with these European explorers marked the dawn of a dark chapter that would never be forgotten in their history. British exploration of Australia began in 1688 when William Dampier arrived, although he had rather negative impressions of the West Australian coast. Nearly a century later, in 1770, James Cook's voyage brought him to the eastern coast of Australia, which he claimed for Britain in King George III's name. While Cook found the indigenous people leading a simple, content life, he also encountered resistance during his initial landing at Botany Bay. Cook's favorable impression of Australia's east coast laid the foundation for British colonization, which began in 1788 when Governor Arthur Phillip led the first fleet to Botany Bay. Philip was instructed to engage with the indigenous people in a friendly manner, marking the start of British influence in Australia. Subsequent settlements were established in Tasmania, 1803, Victoria, 1803, Queensland, 1824, Western Australia, 1826, and the Colony of South Australia, 1836. The Northern Territory saw several attempts at settlement, but it was only in 1869 that permanent settlement was achieved in Darwin after earlier efforts failed. Australia's colonization differed from North American and New Zealand practices, as no treaty was drawn between settlers and indigenous inhabitants. The first fleet members, influenced by their experiences with Native American tribes, often misunderstood and misrepresented Aboriginal systems and concepts. In 1862, British administrative control began in the Torres Strait Islands, with John Jardine appointed as government resident. Missionaries arrived on Erub, Darnley Island, in 1871, and Queensland expanded its boundaries to include the Torres Strait Islands in 1872, eventually annexing them in 1879 as part of the British colony. When Europeans arrived in various regions, 
they often brought diseases such as smallpox, measles, and tuberculosis, to which indigenous people had no immunity, leading to widespread epidemics and staggering population declines. In the 19th century, smallpox was the leading cause of aboriginal deaths, and vaccination efforts for the indigenous population began earnestly in the 1840s. This smallpox epidemic in 1789 is believed to have wiped out as much as 90% of the Darug people. Although the outbreak's exact cause is still a topic of discussion, scholars debate the origin of a smallpox outbreak among indigenous Australians, some point to European settlers, Macassan fishermen, or contact with the First Fleet. Another theory suggests it might have been chickenpox, brought by the First Fleet, to which indigenous people had no immunity. Furthermore, indigenous communities experienced the devastating impact of sexually transmitted infections, notably syphilis and gonorrhea, as a result of European colonization. This colonization also deeply affected them by forcibly seizing their land and water resources. The seizure of land and resources by British colonizers brought enduring hardships to indigenous communities. As vast tracts of land were transformed for livestock farming, traditional food sources like kangaroos were decimated, posing significant challenges to indigenous diets and ways of life. Equally disturbing was the settlers' treatment of aboriginal women, who subjected them to sexual assault and forced prostitution. This horrific exploitation not only inflicted physical and emotional trauma, but also shattered the fabric of indigenous societies. Another painful ordeal the aboriginal people experienced due to colonization was racial abuse. When British settlers arrived in the late 18th century, they brought with them ethnocentric and prejudiced beliefs that viewed indigenous people as inferior. This viewpoint was based on a lack of understanding and appreciation for indigenous cultures, languages, and societies, leading to the initial disregard for their rights and humanity. The discrimination got so bad that racist policies, such as Brisbane's Boundary Streets, were implemented to mark areas where Aboriginal people were restricted from crossing during specific times of the day. However, there are ongoing discussions about changing many of these place names to address this historical injustice. The notion of European superiority fueled discrimination and laid the foundation for the mistreatment, land dispossession, violence, and systemic racism that indigenous communities have endured throughout their history. As a result of the inhumane treatments, by 1900, the official indigenous population in Australia had fallen to around 93,000, but it was an incomplete count, missing many, especially in desert regions. In the early 20th century, many indigenous Australians worked for low wages as stockmen. This economic hardship they faced led to a further population decline, reaching a low of 74,000 in 1933. However, numbers eventually recovered and reached pre-colonization levels by 1995, with about 563,000 indigenous Australians in 2010. During the process of colonization, numerous conflicts and confrontations known as the Frontier War unfolded between settlers and Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities across the continent and its islands. In Queensland, Aboriginal people were killed mainly through civilian hunting parties and the native police. These armed groups of Aboriginal men, often coerced into service, were led by government officers to quell indigenous resistance. Disturbingly, evidence suggests that massacres of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples, initiated by British colonists, persisted until the 1930s. Researchers at the University of Newcastle, led by Lyndall Ryan, have documented nearly 500 massacre sites as of 2020. These incidents resulted in the deaths of 12,361 Aboriginal people and 204 colonists, totaling at least 311 massacres over approximately 140 years. Such devastating massacres inflicted immediate casualties and left survivors extremely vulnerable. They struggled to secure food, reproduce, maintain cultural practices, and protect themselves from further attacks, which affected their communities and posed a threat to their survival. Determining the exact death toll from the frontier wars is challenging because of limited records and the secrecy surrounding many massacres of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. 
Although it's often mentioned that approximately 20,000 Aboriginal Australians and 2,000 colonists lost their lives in these conflicts. Recent research suggests a higher toll of at least 40,000 Aboriginal casualties and 2,000 to 2,500 settler deaths. Moreover, some studies propose an even more staggering figure, estimating a minimum of 65,000 Aboriginal deaths in Queensland alone. To further advance their agenda of oppressing and subjugating Indigenous communities, the government introduced protectionist measures with the goal of isolating and managing Aboriginal populations. In 1937, the Commonwealth government decided to shift its approach towards assimilation policies. These policies aimed to assimilate Aboriginal individuals who were mixed race into the white community, intending to resolve what was seen as the Aboriginal problem. As a result, there was a significant rise in the number of children forcibly taken from their families and placed with white caregivers, either in institutions or foster homes. The underlying idea was to remove them from their indigenous heritage and culture, with the belief that assimilation into white society was in their best interest. Not only children were forcibly taken, the indigenous men and women were also forcibly removed from their traditional lands and communities and relocated to missions, reserves, or penal colonies. During these forced relocations, they were subjected to harsh and inhumane conditions. Neck chains, handcuffs, and other forms of physical restraints were used to maintain control and prevent escape. The missions and reserves were often overcrowded and provided inadequate living conditions, with indigenous people experiencing forced labor, exploitation, and loss of cultural identity. Women were forced into domestic work, and indigenous children were frequently separated from their families as part of assimilation policies known as the Stolen Generation. The Stolen Generations policy, implemented by both Australian federal and state government agencies and church missions, aimed to eliminate Aboriginal culture under the acts of their respective parliaments. This policy inflicted immense trauma and lasting intergenerational consequences on Indigenous communities. Those affected experienced the loss of their cultural identity and family ties, resulting in lasting emotional and psychological scars. The forcible removal of these children occurred between approximately 1871 and 1969. Although, in some places, children were still being taken in the 1970s. Debates have arisen regarding whether the deaths of Aboriginal people, especially in Tasmania, and the forced removal of children from Aboriginal communities can be considered as genocide. Numerous historical research efforts have examined the massacres and treatment of Aboriginal people. These efforts include institutions like the Center for 21st Century Humanities, led by Lyndall Ryan, the Frontier Conflict Database, and the Australian Commonwealth Government's Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Commission HREOC, during the national inquiry into the separation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander children from their families. In the Human Rights and Equal Opportunity Report, Justice Ronald Wilson's analysis asserts that Australia's policy of forcibly removing Aboriginal children was genocidal. He references the definition of genocide by Raphael Lemkin, which characterizes it as a coordinated plan targeting the essential foundations of indigenous life with the ultimate aim of destroying the groups themselves. This encompassed dismantling their political and social institutions, culture, language, religion, and economic livelihoods while infringing upon personal security, liberty, health, dignity, and even the lives of group members. Significantly, Wilson clarifies that genocide is not limited to physical extermination. It can occur through other means, such as the forced transfer of children, as long as the key elements of the crime are evident. Wilson asserts that genocide can occur through actions like conspiracy and attempts, not just through destruction. He argues that forcibly separating indigenous children from their culture is genocidal, violating international law since December 11, 1946. This practice continued for nearly 25 years, leaving a painful legacy in indigenous Australian history, highlighting the lasting impact of such policies on indigenous communities. However, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander resistance has remained unwavering since the earliest days of colonization. In 1938, 
A significant event called the Aborigines Conference designated the first Australia Day as a day of protest and mourning, which has since been recognized as Survival Day or Invasion Day. Additionally, in 1963, the Yolngu people of Yirrkala sent bark petitions to dispute mining rights. In 1972, on Australia Day, the Aboriginal Tent Embassy was founded to advocate for land rights. These actions highlight the steadfast determination of indigenous communities in pursuing justice, asserting their rights, and preserving their heritage. However, the 1960s marked a turning point in Australia's struggle for Aboriginal rights. In 1962, Commonwealth legislation granted Aboriginal people the right to vote in federal elections. A significant event was the 1965 Freedom Ride, organized by University of Sydney students, which aimed to raise awareness of poor Aboriginal living conditions and discrimination. In 1966, the Wave Hill Walk-Off, led by Vincent Lingiari, protested against poor pay and conditions of the indigenous people, later inspiring the song From Little Things, Big Things Grow. The 1967 referendum allowed federal laws regarding Aboriginal people and ended the exclusion of Aboriginals from the national census, passing with 90.77% support. In 1971, the Gove Land Rights case held that Australia was terra nullius before British settlement, denying native title. However, the 1975 Aboriginal Land Rights Northern Territory Act recognized Aboriginal land rights in the Northern Territory. In 1985, Uluru was returned to the Pitjantjatjara Aboriginal people. Following the 1992 Mabo case, the terra nullius concept was overturned and native title was recognized. In the late 1960s, indigenous Australians began participating in politics, and in 1971, Neville Bonner became the first indigenous senator. The Aboriginal Tent Embassy was later established in 1972, and in 1976, Sir Douglas Nichols assumed the role of governor in South Australia. Ken Wyatt was elected to the House of Representatives in 2010, and Linda Burney in 2016, becoming the first indigenous woman in the House and serving as shadow minister for human services. In sports, Yvonne Goolagong Cawley became a tennis world number one in 1971. Arthur Beetson led the Australian National Rugby League team in 1973, and Mark Ella captained the Australian National Rugby Union team in 1982. Kathy Freeman famously lit the Olympic flame in 2000 and won the 400 meters. Ashley Barty reached world number one in tennis in 2019. In 1900, the government created the controversial Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Commission, ATSIC. These events mark important strides in the ongoing reconciliation process between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. The focus on reconciliation between these two groups gained momentum in the late 20th century, leading to the establishment of the Council for Aboriginal Reconciliation in 1991 to champion this effort. In 1998, a constitutional convention had just six indigenous participants out of many, causing disappointment. An inquiry into the Stolen Generations, launched in 1995, revealed that 10 to 33 percent of Aboriginal children were separated from their families. Under John Howard, the subsequent government largely ignored recommendations, including a formal apology. Proposed changes, like a new constitutional preamble honoring indigenous people, failed in a referendum. Reconciliation remains a significant issue in Australian politics. Eventually, in 1999, the Australian Parliament, led by Prime Minister John Howard and with input from Aboriginal Senator Aidan Ridgway, acknowledged the mistreatment of Indigenous Australians as a dark chapter in national history, but no formal apology was given. However, on February 13, 2008, Prime Minister Kevin Rudd issued a formal apology to the indigenous peoples, particularly the Stolen Generations, expressing regret for their suffering. In 2001, Reconciliation Place in Canberra was dedicated, and in 2004, the Australian government finally abolished ATSIC due to corruption allegations. In 2010, a panel was appointed by the federal government, including indigenous leaders, legal experts, and parliament members like Ken Wyatt. 
They aim to advise on recognizing Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in the federal constitution. Recommendations submitted in January 2012 proposed the removal of constitutional references to race, along with provisions for meaningful recognition and protection from discrimination. Unfortunately, a proposed referendum on constitutional recognition of Indigenous Australians was abandoned in 2013. On May 26, 2017, the Uluru Statement from the Heart was released by delegates at an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander referendum convention near Uluru. It called for a First Nations voice in the Constitution and a Makarata Commission to oversee agreement-making and truth-telling between the government and Indigenous communities, referencing the 1967 referendum including Indigenous Australians in the Constitution. While some Australians, including politicians, may try to downplay the harsh history of colonization in Australia, the brutal mistreatment of Aboriginal people remains undeniable and continues to this day. In recent years, the United Nations has issued scathing reports criticizing Australia for insufficient efforts to address alarming rates of suicide, incarceration, healthcare, and education disparities. Australia now ignores these reports without facing any pressure to respond, maintaining a stranglehold on Indigenous existence, and attempting to force assimilation into their harmful society. Adding to these concerns, Australia continues to celebrate Australia Day on January 26, the date of the British invasion. This choice fuels annual protests, with hundreds of thousands taking to the streets to voice their opposition. These protests symbolize the resilience of Indigenous Australians in the face of ongoing challenges. Despite the historical injustices and contemporary disparities, Indigenous communities are working tirelessly to preserve their cultures, languages, and traditions. Grassroots movements, cultural revitalization efforts, and advocacy for equitable policies are at the forefront of this struggle for recognition and justice. Indigenous voices are becoming increasingly influential on the national stage in this ongoing struggle for justice and recognition. Leaders within these communities are advocating for constitutional reforms, treaty negotiations, and improved socioeconomic conditions. Additionally, many non-Indigenous Australians are actively engaging in dialogue, reconciliation efforts, and education to understand and address the issues facing Indigenous communities. The recognition of past injustices and a commitment to forging a more equitable future is a shared goal. Indigenous Australians and their allies continue to work towards a nation where the unique cultures, histories, and contributions of Indigenous peoples are celebrated and respected. The journey to reconciliation may be long and challenging, but the determination to overcome difficulties and assert Indigenous rights demonstrates the remarkable strength of these communities. As they continue to fight for their rightful place in the nation, the hope for a more inclusive, equitable, and respectful Australia endures. Thank you for joining us on this journey through the history and challenges faced by the Indigenous people of Australia. If you found this content insightful and valuable, we invite you to show your support by liking this video, subscribing to our channel, and clicking on the notification bell. By doing so, you'll stay updated with our latest content and help us continue sharing important stories and knowledge. Your engagement matters, and we appreciate your support.